in the Upanishads are the earliest, the, which we've already gone over, are the earliest texts we'll be considering um, in the course. Uh, so they precede everything else we're reading. Uh, but the Yoga Sutra is actually a bit later than the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, I'm doing them in the reverse order because the Bhagavad Gita introduces not only yogic principles uh, as the Yoga Sutra does, but it also introduces issues of Dharma and Bhakti uh, that I want to introduce, I want to address later. Uh, in addition, uh, even though the Yoga Sutra is, Sutras are uh, uh, dense, and in some ways difficult to follow, I think there's a uh, uh, kind of intuitive plausibility or intuitive accessibility to them uh, that is uh, uh, makes them easier to address first. Um, so in other words, I think you can uh, come to understand the Yoga Sutra on its, on its own more readily and it can contribute to understanding the Bhagavad Gita subsequently. So, so that's why we're doing them in that order. Um, I'm going to be talking about some different translations. Uh, I've given you in the syllabus a, uh, a link uh, to a pretty good translation that also, there, there are a couple of anomalies in it, um, but it uh, pretty well represents uh, I mean, it, it's a good, it's a, as I say, I think it's a pretty good translation. Um, and it gives you the Sanskrit, uh, so you can consult that too. So I think that's uh, very valuable. Uh, and we'll be doing that. Um, we'll be looking at the Sanskrit uh, some. So uh, today, uh, I'm going to try to present a sort of schematic um, account of these, the, the stages of yogic practice, the components of yogic practice, insofar as these can be uh, abstracted or drawn out from the Yoga Sutras. Um, hmm. Um, I'm not sure I want to go through these first. Uh, oh yeah, the na nature of the text. I, actually, I should have the fifth bullet point first. Uh, the first thing I want should mention here uh, concerns the nature of the text you'll be reading. Uh, as I said, it's very dense. It's very uh, uh, cryptic in many ways. It's uh, boiled down to a series of basically aphorisms. Um, it's a commonplace, or maybe maybe that's an exaggeration, but a, a standard, one standard view about the text is that it is a, com a compilation of two different source texts. Um, as you may know, uh, ancient texts are often viewed as compilations. Uh, they often include uh, contradictions, uh, differences in vocabulary, differences in uh, uh, beliefs, uh, the beliefs they articulate, uh, differences in um, uh, other language differences. Um, um, and uh, commonly, this is explained in terms of uh, two or more source texts. Uh, so uh, biblical scholars uh, distinguish the um, Yahwistic tradition and the Elohistic tradition in the Hebrew Bible, for example. There are um, uh, uh, sections of the Bible that refer to God as Yahweh and sections that refer to God as Elohim. Uh, and uh, uh, they, there are other variants, uh, variants that go all the way th from, from the early parts of the Hebrew Bible through the Christian New Testament. 
and again, these are commonly explained uh, as being as uh, having different sources. These uh, differences, uh, I mean, in the New Testament, the source different sources are marked uh, as being, you know, the Gospel according to Mark or versus the Gospel according to Matthew or whatever. Uh, but in the, in say Genesis, they're not marked in that way. So, this is. Uh, the idea that uh, the Yoga Sutra has more than one source is used to explain uh, some of the peculiarity, some of the repetition, some of the apparent contradiction, uh, some uh, properties are categorized under different parts of, of uh, yoga practice. Uh, and it would seem that uh, it would, a given practice, uh, a property or activity would be would fall under one and not the other. Um, and so the assumption is that in different traditions, uh, that activity was located differently. Um, uh, sort of, um, we'll, we'll, I'm going to assume that there are different sources here. Uh, and I'm going to assume that about the Bhagavad Gita too. Uh, I think it's even more strikingly the case in the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, though uh, uh, the Gita has been gone through uh, by uh, subsequent uh, compilers or writers uh, to make it uh, fit uh, consistently uh, within the larger epic Mahabharata, of which it is a part, as I've mentioned in previous lectures. Um, uh, sort of uh, assimilating it to uh, some of Aristotle's writings, uh, I'm going to see the Yoga Sutras uh, as, in effect, lecture notes. Um, they're uh, like bullet points on a PowerPoint presentation. They don't really, on their own, they don't really teach you things. Uh, the assumption is that they would go along, that uh, they would be accompanied by a, a teacher, and the, uh, the guru would explicate uh, the bullet points. It's, again, as I say, it's sort of a, uh, an ancient version of power, a PowerPoint presentation rather than an essay. Uh, and so it's... Uh, um, dense uh, elliptical quality is uh, due to that, uh, it is in part explicable by, by that. Um, uh, it, it also, uh, I'm, although in the next lecture, I will go through it, uh, much of it in order from beginning to end. In this lecture, I'm going to basically ignore order uh, uh, the sequence in which it's given in the text and just discuss the parts that seem to me to require discussion uh, logically uh, as they proceed um, uh, in the uh, practice of yoga rather than the way in which they proceed in the text. So just to remind you, yoga is the uh, yoga philosophy or the yoga darshan uh, is the sort of practical version of Sankhya, uh, the, these being uh, two of the uh, six major schools of um, ancient Indic uh, philosophy, um, along with uh, Advaita Vedanta and so on. Um, uh, with uh, Sankhya, it shares with Sankhya dualism, uh, a belief that there is both Purusha and Prakriti, spirit and matter. Again, Prakriti commonly translated as nature. Uh, it means all of matter, but it is also sort of prototypically associated with nature in our sense of trees and rivers and that sort of thing, as opposed to artifacts. So, it does, in fact, include artifacts. Again, Prakriti includes what we call mind. Um, Prakriti 
uh, the way in which the uh, Sankhya philosophers and yoga philosophers uh, avoided the Vedantic, the Advaita Vedantic idea that um, Prakriti is unreal because it changes, uh, the way that they avoided that uh, view or resolved that apparent dilemma is by positing eternal constituents of nature, the gunas, uh, literally strands, uh, commonly translated as qualities. There are three of these. Um, uh, as I've translated, I mean, they're, I didn't translate them, as they're always translated. Uh, Rajas, Tamas, and Sattva, as they're always translated uh, in its sort of physical version. Uh, again, all of this is uh, what uh, philosophers today would refer to as dual aspect. The same three components of matter explain both what we would consider physical and what we would consider mental. Uh, so insofar as rajas is construed physically, it's dynamism. It's uh, what uh, drives uh, flowing rivers. It's what uh, uh, blows things around on the surface of the earth. It's what uh, causes things to fall. Uh, it's all of the uh, uh, physical, um, uh, the material causality that uh, uh, is continually uh, transforming uh, the various gunas in the world. So rajas has the, that physical quality of dynamism. Well, what is parallel to dynamism in the, that's mental? Well, it's uh, motivation uh, or passion. So insofar as you feel passionate about something, you will pursue it. And in pursuing it, uh, you will engage in the sorts of dynamic interaction with the material, uh, with the mat uh, material world uh, that uh, is characteristic of Rajas. Thomas, uh, on the other hand, is uh, in um, uh, the physical, the material sense is inertia. It's uh, the aspect, just as Rajas is what keeps uh, the earth moving, things changing. Thomas is what holds them back, uh, what keeps them in the same state. Uh, what keeps things, what holds things back or keeps them in the same state mentally, uh, you may be surprised to find this, is not indifference, but is ignorance. So why is that? Well, if you remember, ignorance is um, one's misunderstanding of the material world, one's failure to recognize that Purusha is not property and so on. So uh, ignorance is indeed what keeps you uh, stuck in sansara, in the cycle of birth and death. So it's in that sense that it's the sort of uh, greatest example of inertia, uh, that uh, embeddedness in uh, the cycle of suffering uh, due to birth and death. And finally, there's sattva, which is uh, usually translated as lucidity. Uh, it governs such things as light, uh, luminescence in the material world, and uh, thought in the uh, mental world. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, according to this theory, that's why you use metaphors of light uh, to explain uh, people's uh, thought. Uh, your, uh, and the thought is localized uh, particularly in the part of the mind called buddhi, B-U-D-D-H-I. And as we'll talk about later, uh, these gunas are hierarchized um, in the sense that sattva is considered superior to rajas and tamas, uh, and uh, yogic practice Though, of course, you have to eventually uh, divest yourself of a, an attachment to sattva. Uh, you, 
because you have to recognize that you are Purusha, not Prakriti at all, and thus you're not even Sattva. Uh, you begin by dissociating yourself from Rajas and Tamas. As you dissociate yourself from those, you become, you come to identify yourself more fully with lucidity, with sattva, with buddhi. But you have to overcome even that because that is not identical with purusha. Uh, it is, however, higher hierarchically, spiritually. It is more akin to purusha. It is more likely to lead to a recognition of purusha. So, um, so what is purusha? Well, basically, Purusha is what is doing the observing. And all of Prakriti, whether physical or mental, is what Purusha is observing. And so I used the example before. If you think of some, you're think, just think about yourself, what situation you're in, you're looking at a computer screen. So it's you looking at this computer screen. Uh, but in order to think of you looking at the computer screen, you have to, so to speak, adopt a third position. You, you sort of put yourself over to the side and you think, well, there's me and there's the computer screen and I am thinking of the computer screen. But you have to abstract yourself from that relationship in order to cognize uh, the relationship. So uh, in these terms, Purusha is continually retreating uh, from observation. Uh, you think of yourself as thinking of the computer screen, then the self that you refer to there is not the self who's thinking. It's You've retreated from that and you, the self you're thinking of is an object. Uh, I could put it even more crudely in terms of like mirrors. Suppose you want to look at yourself and you put up a mirror um, so that you see yourself, uh, you see this image of yourself looking at the computer screen. Well, what you're seeing there is a, an objectification. It isn't your observing self. It's an image of your, it's an observed image of your observing self. Your observing self is still removed from that. And so that's what Purusha is, is that observing self. And uh, the problem uh, of attachment to the material world, according to Sankhya and yoga, is that uh, we confuse um, what we observe with ourselves. We confuse the mind that we see with what we are in ourselves. We confuse Prakriti with Purusha. So here, for example, um, oh, in the Brahadaranyaka Upanishad, or actually, or maybe my favorite Upanishad, um, it describes uh, the, uh, it describes the Purusha as the unseen seer, the unheard hearer, the unthought thinker, the ununderstood understander. So why ununderstood understander? Well, in order to understand something, you have to, so to speak, back up. Uh, you have the, the subject that's, even when, you're, when you think of yourself as understanding yourself, you make yourself into an object for understanding, but what's doing the understanding is separate from that object. And then uh, similarly with uh, the unthought thinker, uh, again, you have to retreat uh, from the self-objectification in order to be able to observe uh, that self uh, that has been objectified. And so another instance, I think this is from Manu, I don't remember, I'll tell you when I find it. Um, oh no, this is from the Sankhya Karaka. Uh, so it, Sankhya, that makes more sense, that it would be from the uh, foundational text of Sankhya. Um, the spirit is witness 
and has isolation neutrality uh, and is the seer and inactive. Uh, so witness consciousness is often what Purusha is referred to. It observes uh, property. It does not do, it does not act. You, you only identify with what you observe. You think you're acting, but you are not in fact acting. Uh, it's merely the turnings of the gunas in Prakriti that are transforming. You, you as Purusha are doing nothing in this view. Um, 2.3. Um, let's see. Well, maybe I should have just done it on the 2.3. As translated here, um, the causes of, suffer of suffering are not seeing things as they are, the sense of I, attachment, aversion, and clinging to life. Um, oh, yeah, actually, I wanted this for something else. But anyway, uh, the, uh, you, if you don't see things as they are, you think that the I, the ego, um, asmita is one uh, a, a way in which it's often put in the Sanskrit, ahankara, A-H-A-M-K-A-R-A, -A -A, uh, I-ness is another way it's put. These are two uh, assertions of an ego, two ways of phrasing an assertion of an ego with which Purusha identifies itself falsely. Uh, you are not identified with that I. Uh, this gives rise to attachment and aversion and clinging to life, uh, which, we will, which are the um, main sources of, uh, of suffering and they all result from this sense of ahankara uh, or asmita in this case. Uh, which is to say uh, egoism. Um, oh, that wasn't from 432, that was from 183. Let me see what 183 is. Um, okay, 183 was the laws of Manu. I knew there was laws of Manu in here. Um, oh yeah, this, uh, this says uh, a key uh, a feature of the, uh, a key result of yogic practice is that you will, quote, uh, not desire to die, not desire to live. Uh, now, I just wanted to go through those because you'll find that the translation of 2.3, de depending on which translation you pick up, if you stick to the translation I just gave you, you're fine. Uh, but if you pick up another translation, uh, you may read the, the translator indicating that uh, yoga is opposed to, quote, the will to live. And I just want to note, uh, this bothers a lot of readers. Um, uh, Barbara Miller, uh, whose translation I often use in the class, or have often used in the class, uh, translates the passage that way. And uh, it often bothers students because losing the will to live in ordinary English idiom means uh, being despairing and suicidal. So I wanted to emphasize by quoting the um, laws of Manu uh, that it isn't a matter of being despairing. It's a matter of not having inordinate uh, fear uh, of, not inordinate, not having a fear of death, not, uh, not being attached to life in the sense that uh, you are dreading death. It doesn't mean that you uh, want to commit suicide because if you wanted to commit suicide, you would of course be attached to some sort of well-being that you're not experiencing in life. And that's of course why you would uh, be suicidal. It'd be because you are, are experiencing suffering in your life. And that is, it's that sense of suffering 
that um, yoga wants to eliminate. And it wants to eliminate it not through suicide, but through detachment that would make you cling neither to life nor cling to the loss of life, neither be uh, uh, fearful of death nor be desirous of death, as it says in the uh, Law Book of Manu. By the way, um, I don't remember if I've mentioned this before, but I'm using that uh, Radha Krishnan and more book uh, so frequently that I'm going to keep referring to it as an R, just as R and M. Um, I uh, I've given the citation for it in the first uh, in, well, the first lecture. I was going to say in the first PowerPoint, but I think the first PowerPoint is doesn't have a bibliography. The first lecture PowerPoint I give the reference. Okay. So, uh, so those are just some preliminaries just to remind you of the Sankhya background and to get past the uh, <clears throat> uh, will to live issue that uh, understandably uh, disturbs a lot of uh, people. So this is again my schematization of the Yoga Sutra. And my contention is that the Yoga Sutra sets out principles uh, for work in two areas uh, to achieve peace and freedom. Uh, again, peace is the state of non-attachment. Shanti is what it is in Sanskrit, uh, or shanta. Uh, you, uh, uh, the, for the most part, there are some schools that aim for bliss, ananda, uh, but generally, the aim of uh, spiritual practices in India is to achieve peace or equilibrium, uh, a sense of neither desiring nor rejecting, contentment, uh, emotional balance. So that's the emotional goal of the, these processes. And freedom is, of course, freedom from sansara, freedom from the painful cycle of birth and death. In other words, freedom here translates moksha, uh, the ultimate goal of life, the ultimate purushartha. And in order to achieve peace and freedom, you need to work in two areas. Ordinary life, um, what you do most of the day, and in your specific meditative practices, because even if you are in an ashram, uh, hermitage, uh, you, um, most of your day is not spent meditating. It's most of your day is spent doing other things. So you need to combine uh, ordinary life practices with specific meditative practices. Uh, different schools of yoga emphasize one or the other uh, so that, as you'll see in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, the uh, um, practice of uh, what's called karma yoga, action yoga, uh, advocated in much of the Bhagavad Gita, focuses on ordinary life and achieving uh, peace and freedom principally through alterations in ordinary life. Uh, others' uh, philosophical approaches emphasize jnana yoga, uh, J-N-A-N-A, -A, uh, that is uh, uh, knowledge, practices in learning, which are not quite meditative, but are more along the lines of meditative. Um, the uh, uh, yoga of the Yoga Sutra is specifically meditative, uh, or is particularly uh, focused on meditative techniques. Uh, although um, it spends a, enough time, I mean, it's a short document, uh, it spends enough time on ordinary life as well. Uh, moreover, uh, the way I would organize this uh, account of yoga, I, I would distinguish two aspects of each of these areas. Uh, one aspect is action or movement, what you, what you do. The other is experience. Uh, so it's 
activity and passivity, what you engage, what comes to you. So you have to uh, do things with regard to ordinary life that uh, control or modify or develop your own actions or movements and your own experiences, what happens to you. And the same thing is true in specific meditative practices. There's what you do and what comes to you. Now I'm going to begin with ordinary life. The key thing you already know from the first line of the Yoga Sutra, um, well, the second line, and the first line is, this is the teaching of yoga, uh, the second line of the Yoga Sutra, uh, Chitta Vritti Niroda. Uh, chit, chit, chitta is thought. Um, vritti, it's almost onomatopoetic, means turnings, and Niroda means either, it's often translated as elimination. Uh, I like to translate it as restraint or reining in of the turnings of thought. Um, it's, uh, you have to control, your thought is continually moving on from one thing to another. Um, you notice this uh, perhaps if you're like trying to go to sleep and you, but your mind keeps taking you places that you don't want to go, keeps reminding you of stuff, keeps leading you on to worries and so on. Uh, stuff you have to do tomorrow, st st embarrassing things you've done today, wh whatever. So the, these are the turnings of thought. And you're not going to achieve peace and uh, freedom unless you restrain those turnings of thought. So. Uh, uh, both your action and your experience in ordinary life should be such that they minimize the turnings of thought on their own. Uh, the sorts of profession you engage in, uh, the sorts of environment you're living in uh, can either uh, enhance or diminish those turnings. Uh, secondly, as I've already mentioned, uh, in both action and experience, you should undertake, you should place yourself in circumstances uh, where you will become increasingly sattvic. Uh, in other words, uh, you do not, you should not place yourself in circumstances that would cultivate uh, rajas or passion. So you don't go to... Um, uh, like wild parties or something. Um, you might go to uh, a yoga lecture, but you wouldn't go to a, a dance club if you were uh, pursuing this uh, line. Uh, the yogic lecture would appeal to sattva, to buddhi, to the uh, intellect, um, the uh, uh, dance club would appeal to and arouse rajas, uh, the passionate guna. Uh, and again, remember a basic principle of yoga. Uh, I think I've mentioned it before. I must. It comes up later in this talk anyway, is that you become what you do. So you keep doing something. Yeah, I talked about it with piano playing. So if you keep doing stuff that's rajasic, as it's called, that uh, arouses rajas or passion, you will become more dominated by passion. If you continue to do things that are more sattvic, you will become dominated by sattva. And becoming do dominated by sat sattva is not the final goal, but it is, uh, it uh, contributes to the achievement of the final goal. It brings you closer to a recognition of yourself as Purusha. Have I gotten? Oh, there we go. Uh, and of course, ultimately you have to move from Sattva to Purusha. You have to recognize that even the intellect is not you, that you are merely the observer of the intellect.
ordinary life continued. So action. So what do you do? What are the basic principles of the sorts of action you should undertake? Uh, oh, I was premature in uh, introducing the beca you become what you do. I knew it was in the uh, slideshow. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I've already clarified this in an earlier lecture with regard to uh, uh, piano playing is a good example. Uh, if you play the piano, you start out playing the piano and you, you're, you're by no means, uh, there's no way you could be characterized as a pianist. But uh, you do it every day and do it every day and you become more and more a pianist until uh, you've done it for 20 years and you are in fact a pianist. Uh, and you've made yourself what you've done. The same idea holds for becoming um, peaceful and achieving moksha, be, becoming peaceful and detached, becoming yogic. Um, this is from... Again, the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. Um, you can see why it's my, perhaps my favorite Upanishad. According as one acts, according as one conducts oneself, so does he become. The doer of good becomes good. The doer of evil becomes evil. One becomes virtuous by virtuous action, bad by bad action. So this gives it a moral uh, coloring. And um, typically uh, in moving across the Purusharthas, the goals of life, uh, you would try to uh, abandon Kama and Artha in most uh, spiritual practices, uh, initially pursuing Dharma and then moving from Dharma to a complete detachment uh, because Dharma itself implies a sort of attachment, maybe, uh, maybe a sort of lower level attachment to reputation to other people thinking that you're moral, uh, maybe a slightly superior attachment to your own self-judgment, being able to imagine yourself as a, a dutiful spouse or a dutiful son or daughter or whatever. But you, uh, to be released, you have to overcome even that because even that is a form of egoism. Um, so uh, uh, at the uh, dharmic level, uh, you can speak of this as uh, becoming what you do it, what you do uh, in terms of becoming moral or immoral, ethical or unethical. But at the level of moksha, you would speak of it in terms of uh, detachment uh, versus egoism. And of course, in action, you have to do everything you can to produce to reduce what produces the turnings. So this involves, for example, engaging in positive actions, actions that are, for example, selfless, uh, actions that are dharmic rather than rajasic or, uh, uh, excuse me, dharmic rather than uh, rajasic in relation to artha or kama. Uh, uh, in other words, moral actions as opposed to passionate actions bearing on pleasure or power and uh, authority and wealth, uh, though ultimately the positive actions have to be um, based on moksha, detachment rather than uh, dharma. But initially, uh, dharma should replace the uh, earlier, the two lower uh, goals of life. Uh, when you have um, a strong inclination to conform uh, to follow um, the impulses of uh, the rajasic or, uh, or tamasic impulses rather than sattvic promptings. Uh, if you have strong inclinations to succumb to uh, the desire for kama, uh, pleasure, especially uh, pr prototypically sexual pleasure, or artha, uh, wealth and power. If you have those tendencies, a central yogic principle is to cultivate the opposite, to try to do the reverse, 
So this is why um, instead of uh, experiencing pleasure, you might, uh, contrary to the Buddhist practice, you might engage in something uh, painful, uh, doing the reverse of what your inclination is. Um, a, more a better example, the, the pleasure pain one is perhaps not the ideal example. A better example perhaps is if you tend to be greedy, how do you oppose that? Well, one way of uh, uh, overcoming uh, an attachment to material wealth is to force yourself to be generous. So uh, if you uh, find yourself resenting uh, giving the uh, minimum amount of money that you're required to give for taxes, say, um, increase that amount uh, through, say, charitable giving um, or other means that actually uh, forces you uh, to do the opposite of succumb to your uh, greedy tendencies. So that cultivating the opposite is a general uh, aspect of action uh, that bears on uh, uh, turning the, uh, uh, reining in the turnings of thought and thus uh, leading to self-realization, yogic self-realization. Uh, in addition to action, uh, there are uh, uh, bodily and mental uh, practices that you need to pay attention to. Um, and uh, these, uh, uh, well, well, we will get to those. You have to uh, take care of your body in particular ways um, in ordinary life. Uh, and you have to... Uh, uh, practice certain sorts of uh, discipline with the mind. Uh, so with regard to action, uh, there's things you do, but even when you've taken up and responded to, you've reworked the various things that you actually engage in doing, material actions, giving away money, helping people, uh, you know, visiting the sick, whatever. But there are also things that happen to you uh, and you need to address those too. So experience needs to be addressed as well as action. The basic principle here is again, reduce whatever produces turnings. Uh, whatever um, makes your th thoughts spin out of control where you uh, don't, can't rein them in. And uh, this includes crucially, establishing a minimally disturbing environment. So, for example, if you genuinely want to achieve um, equanimity and moksha, it may not be being in a, a big city, uh, a city with lots of parties, lots of nightlife and so on, lots of noise, lots of frenzy, lots of hard work, um, uh, conflict, anger, overcrowding, um, uh, pollution. This, may, this is all likely to give rise to turnings of thought and is uh, unlikely to produce an atmosphere conducive to spiritual advancement. If you contrast this with uh, a hermitage, uh, a, an isolated uh, group of monks uh, and, uh, well, not really monks, of because uh, it's men and women both um, in uh, Hindu practice, uh, people who have uh, retreated uh, outside of cities into um, forest land, where they live among nature, they live simply, they live quietly, they don't have a wide range of pressing tasks. Uh, again, this is the, for in the traditional Hindu scheme, this is for the third stage of life, this is after you've been a householder. And so uh, uh, retreating to the 
uh, it's called vanaprastha, uh, the uh, stage of retreating, going to the uh, forest uh, to live in this uh, peaceful environment, a natural environment that is conducive uh, to uh, uh, peaceful thoughts, uh, un, unhurried, untroubled thinking. Here, uh, the body is uh, uh, figures uh, particularly importantly, um, specifically, it's uh, the way you experience your body uh, is going to affect whether you are um, detached and peaceful and content or not. And it, this is one of the reasons why bodily health uh, is an important aspect of yogic practice. Developing, uh, treating your body properly, uh, following a diet that is uh, healthy uh, by the lights of yogic practice. There's a, a whole theory of how different types of food have different uh, effects on Rajas, Tamas, and Sattva, and so on. But uh, leaving that, uh, which is part of Ayurveda, uh, part of the teachings about health, uh, the sort of traditional uh, medicine, um, uh, well, not sort of, it is the traditional medicine, uh, traditional medical theory, you might say. Uh, even leaving that aside, uh, even if you don't uh, focus on Ayurveda in particular, uh, the importance of healthy diet uh, to achieve uh, a neutral state of the body is crucial because that ex uh, affects what you're experiencing all the time. And a new neutral state means neither pleasure nor pain. So obviously it means not pain. You don't want to be in pain all the time um, because then you're certainly going to have turnings of thought. So you want to uh, uh, treat your body in such a way as to minimize pain. But that doesn't mean you want to be seeking pleasure all the time, because if you're seeking pleasure all the time, that too is caught producing turnings of thought. So you want a neutral, calm, contented, peaceful state of the body, and that's uh, best achieved through uh, healthy practices, including the exercise aspects of yoga, which are not uh, addressed in this book, in the Yoga Sutras, uh, but are uh, germane to uh, ordinary life experience and the cultivation of a body that conduces toward self-realization. Where's my cursor? Okay. Now, uh, with regard to both action and experience, there are specific pre uh, prescriptions, uh, specific uh, things that the uh, Yoga Sutra says you should do, specifically adopt the external and internal disciplines, as they're called. Uh, and I'm going to read to, the, to, to you from... Uh, uh, yet another translation. It's not the one you have, but that, I mean, that's okay. You you can read them in the one online. It's They're similar enough. Uh, so 228 is discernment in vision. No, excuse me. Discernment yields radiant knowledge when one practices the eight limbs of yoga and impurity dwindles. So discernment means being able to distinguish Purusha from Prakriti, self from ego. Ego is again Prakriti. Purusha is just the observer. So this is that, being able to make that distinction is the sort of crucial endpoint for all these practices. Uh, as uh, Patanjali says on uh, 226, unceasing discernment is the way of achieving cessation or reigning in. Uh, it's the way to constrain 
the turnings of thoughts is uh, to have, to continually uh, discriminate between Purusha and its objects, ego, uh, mind, even buddhi, uh, recognizing that all of those are not, are not um, the self. The self is Purusha. Okay. So I am in one tw and two twenty eight. We mentioned the eight limbs of yoga. The eight limbs of yoga are restraints, observances, postures, breath control, withdrawal of the senses, concentration, meditation, and samadhi. Uh, the um, your version, your online version, has uh, a slightly different list. Let me go to it. Uh, I mean, slightly different translation. Uh, but it's the same, it's the same list, if I can find it here. Mm. 29, okay. Um, the eight components of yoga, components is actually probably better than limbs. Limbs is kind of weird, but that's the way everybody translates it. Uh, Almost all uh, translations refer to the limbs of yoga, so, uh, but components is probably more uh, comprehensible. Our external discipline, internal discipline, posture, breath regulation, concentration, meditative absorption, and integration is uh, this person's translation for samadhi. I'm simply going to use samadhi, and indeed, generally, I, instead of referring to concentration, uh, uh, which is the way I, I have it here in my uh, little version, um, also, in, but in, instead of referring to it as concentration, I'll usually refer to it as dharana. And instead of meditative absorption in his version or meditation in my version, I'll typically refer to that by the Sanskrit of dharana. Um, um, excuse me, of dhyana um, for meditation. Dharna for concentration, dhyana for medita meditation or meditative absorption. And uh, uh, samadhi, samadhi, I'm not even going to translate. I'm going to uh, leave that to get a uh, meaning on its own. So... Uh, just to connect you with this uh, this uh, version. Let's see how are we doing on time here? Okay. Um, yeah, we have a little over 20 minutes. All right. So I'll just read a few of these to give you a sense of what um, the restraints. So adopt the external and internal disciplines or what are here called the restraints and... Um, observances. The restraints are non-violence or ahinsa, non-harming, satya or truthfulness, asteya or non-stealing, brahmacharya, which I would translate as chaste devotion to study. Brahmacharya is the period of studenthood. It's chaste because um, simply the way the society was set up, there would not really be occasion for uh, sexual relations with anyone, uh, you'd be uh, simply studying uh, in a, um, um, boys would be studying alone with boys. Uh, I mean, I guess there could be uh, uh, same sex uh, sexual relations in that context, but uh, there wouldn't be, uh, it's prior to marriage. So it's prior to the householder stage. So that's why it's referred to as chaste. You haven't yet entered the householder stage. Uh, and uh, finally, aparigraha, non-grasping. These are the great vow and are valid at all levels, irrespective of birth or caste, place, time, or circumstance. So, um, uh, <clears throat> As we'll see when we get to Dharma, there are aspects of ethical duty that vary with caste or other things doing with, to do with one's situation and so on. 
the point here is that if you were to pursue yoga, uh, these restraints are uh, unreachable. They are an absolute requirement. Uh, and you can see why they would be a requirement if you are unable to practice nonviolence, if you're unable to practice truthfulness, uh, if you're uh, unable to practice non, uh, non-greediness and so on, then uh, you have no place in a uh, hermitage, for example. You, you um, well, I could imagine somebody saying that you would perhaps belong in the a retinue of uh, some politician whose name I won't mention, but whose initials are Donald Trump. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I'm that. I, I didn't mean that. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm not going to go through these in, in detail, but um, uh, because I want to make sure we get through this part today. Uh, so that we can look in uh, at passages in more detail uh, at the next lecture. Um, the observances, which are the second part, uh, internal disciplines, they're sometimes called, are purification, contentment, tapas, uh, asceticism, you remember, svadhyaya, or scriptural study, so that is studying the Vedas, studying this text, studying other, the Upanishads, I should say, uh, this text, other uh, yogic uh, Sankhya texts, and so on. Uh, and dedication to Ishvara. It's interesting that unlike the Upanishadic texts in the Yoga Sutra, uh, as in the um, uh, Bhagavad Gita, a, uh, the presence of a more or less personified deity uh, becomes an important part of the yogic practice, which was not really the case in the uh, in much of the Upanishads, despite the fact that the Vedas widely refer to and concern uh, anthrop- anthropomorphic deities. So the, this this is a change from Upanishadic uh, practices. Um, so just to continue reading a little longer, uh, 33, to repel cog- cogitation, cultivate the opposite. Co- cogitation is explained uh, at uh, 1.17 and 1.43 as a limited uh, way of detaching yourself uh, from the world. Um, let me say 143. Um, so um, ultimately, you have to move from a status when you, where you are self-consciously aware of pursuing non-detachment to a more spontaneous, unreflective, automatic uh, experience of non-detachment. So to repel cognition, cultivate the opposite. So that's another thing to do uh, in the, uh, in your um, uh, ordinary life in uh, practicing to become, uh, to uh, real, to uh, in, uh, achieve spiritual self-realization through yoga. Uh, then uh, 2.34 returns, uh, returns us to the uh, uh, external and internal disciplines, specifically the external disciplines or restraints, as they're sometimes called. And it remarks, cogitation regarding harm, hinsa, as opposed to ahinsa, nonviolence. So even thinking about violence, whether done, caused to be done, or approved, in other words, whether you've done it uh, you've had somebody else do it, or you saw somebody else do it, or learned somebody else did, did it, and you approved of it. Uh, in any of those cases, 
uh, thought about violence, whether arising from desire, anger, or delusion, whether, whether modest, middling, or beyond measure. So no matter what its intensity, no matter what its emotional source, it has unbounded ignorance and suffering as its fruit. So cultivate the opposite. So that integrates the ideas about the restraints and observances, the in external and internal disciplines, integrates those with the idea of um, cultivating the opposite. Uh, and again, so uh, if you cultivate the opposite of violence, you do everything you can, uh, every kindness you can, uh, that would be the uh, uh, inverse of being violent. Whenever you might have been violent, you, you, you don't, don't act merely neutrally, but act in a, a positive, uh, conciliatory, kind way. So that the, by forcing yourself sort of in the opposite direction from violence, you overcome that tendency towards violence. Similarly, if you're grasping, if you're greedy, uh, move toward uh, generosity and so on. I, I'm not sure if I was recording then or not. Oh, well, uh, if I wasn't recording, I just explained that um, uh, the uh, items two through a two, uh, two point, Thirty through thirty-five set out the external and internal constraints. For example, uh, nonviolence, and emphasize that uh, in ordinary life, uh, it's destructive to uh, contemplate them at all, even if the contemplation doesn't involve doing them. Even if it merely involves approving of other people engaging in violence or engaging in theft or whatever. And that in each case, you should cultivate the opposite. So if you're inclined toward violence, behave with uh, kindness. Um, don't simply restrain, refrain, don't simply repress the violent impulse, but go in the opposite direction. Similarly, if you're afflicted with greed, don't merely suppress your greediness, but uh, engage in generous behavior. Uh, I, if I said that before, I apologize. I, something happened where I couldn't tell whether I had uh, done that already or not. Whether I was recording, well, I knew I had done it already, but I couldn't tell whether I was recording or not. So I figured it'd be better to give a brief version again uh, than to miss it entirely. Okay, so now we move from uh, everyday life, the things we've been talking about thus far, are the things that a yogic practitioner has to do in ordinary life to achieve self-realization. But you also, a certain amount of time each day, engage in meditative practice. So there's some basic principles of meditative practice. Again, I'm going to divide those into action and experience. Um, and uh, as regards action, I'm going to make a broad division. Again, what you want to do is minimize and stable, well, actually not again. In action, you want to minimize and stabilize motion of any sort. Uh, you want to be um, still uh, because the stillness of your body will foster a stillness in your thought. Uh, it will foster um, a restraint on the turnings of thought, which is again, the goal of this, uh, of this yogic practice. And again, I would uh, distinguish two categories, gross and subtle uh, action, gross action. Uh, by gross action, I mean uh, minimizing and stabilizing the body, especially the limbs. And this is, it's for this purpose that you need the asanas. Um, you need not only the asanas that you typically use for um, meditation, such as the uh, cross-legged uh, or lotus position, where you you know you sit with your legs crossed, your right foot on your left thigh, your left foot on your right thigh, and you know sit up like this with the, the legs crossed like that. 
Um, obviously, you need that for meditation, but the, the whole series of other um, uh, asanas that you do for might do for exercise, those too bear on uh, both ordinary life, uh, health generally, uh, but also on uh, meditation because uh, they're a form of cultivating the opposite insofar as you're stiff, insofar as you can't sit still, insofar as you uh, don't, uh, are, are not at ease, uh, you're, you, can, you find it difficult to just minimize and stabilize motion. Um, the uh, uh, complex asanas or yogic postures train you uh, in extreme cases to minimize and stabilize motion. Uh, so that if, for example, in the posture, uh, I think it's like the frog posture or something it's called, uh, that the uh, fellow is doing in the little inset picture there, if you can keep your balance there, that develops uh, a stability, uh, in, in a non-moving stability in your postures that will extend to the simpler postures that you use in meditation. Uh, so that uh, minimizing and uh, stabilizing motion is uh, sort of the, the meditative uh, goal of the, uh, uh, of the asanas, the yogic postures. Uh, in addition to this sort of gross uh, or large scale minimization and stabilization of motion, you have uh, the more subtle practice of breath control. Breath control uh, is uh, a, a very important part of yogic practice, uh, slowing the breath, controlling the breath, not uh, having the breath uh, be irregular and disturbed is uh, a, a key point in uh, yogic meditation. And it, it fits with the idea of minimizing and stabilizing all forms of uh, bodily motion uh, it, it, such that these will again uh, contribute to the restraint on uh, the turnings of thought. Uh, I might remark here though that um, uh, breath control doesn't work for everyone. I have a, an acquaintance who's done some empirical research on this and um, even though it gen generally works pretty well for people, there are some people who actually do not respond well to focusing on their breath. I happen to be one. I want my breath to just operate on its own. I don't want to have to think about it. Uh, and it like screws me up when I have to try to think about my breath. It's not a good thing for me. And uh, I, it turns out I'm not alone. I'm in a minority. Uh, but I think it's worth mentioning that um, uh, self-consciousness about breathing doesn't always produce the beneficial uh, effects that uh, it's that are sometimes claimed. Um, uh, just reading a few. Well, do I want to read those? Um, well, I, I've noted some passages to look at here. Uh, I'm. I think I'm going to skip them for now uh, because they bear out what I'm saying here. But uh, I mean, for example, 46 to 49 in my translation here, uh, asanas should be steady and glad or relaxed. One should relax one's effort and coincide with the infinite. Then one will be unassailable by dual dualities pleasure and pain, hot and cold, those sorts of things. After this comes breath control, inhibiting the flow of breath in and breathing out and so on. That's um, uh, uh, 46 to 49, for example, uh, uh, which I mentioned in the slide there, or 12 to 16. Restraint of the turnings of thought comes through practice. Uh, practice is exertion to maintain stability. Uh, it becomes firm as the earth when it is continued for a long time in the right manner, and so on. So these are sort of scattered 
observations in the Yoga Sutra, but I think they point pretty clearly and directly to this sort of uh, uh, practice that I'm isolating here. Then there is, in addition to minimizing action, uh, to constraints on action, there are constraints on experience. And again, you want to minimize and stabilize, in this case, experience rather than movement. So uh, what do you have to experience? Well, there's perception. So you have to withdraw the senses, w withdraw, withdraw from the senses. And so that's described in 254 to 255. Um, and again, my translation, it's uh, withdrawal of the sense organs mirrors, as it were, the intrinsic form of thought um, severed from its object, uh, hence the ultimate subjugation of the sense organs. So instead of uh, attending to what you see and what you feel and so on, you uh, withdraw your attention from uh, the, the skin, what you feel, uh, the eyes, what you see, and so on. And there are particular techniques for doing that. Uh, with the eyes, you uh, withdraw from the senses by, for example, focusing on a single point, half closing your eyes. Uh, the problem with closing your eyes entirely is that you might fall victim to tummus and fall asleep. Um, rather, and of course, if you have your eyes wide open and are looking around, then you're not withdrawing from withdrawing your senses. Uh, so uh, focus on a single point uh, is uh, often uh, of, of value in uh, withdrawal of the sense of vision. What about sound? Uh, sound is less, uh, less controlled by uh, attentiveness than a vision is. It's easier to, uh, you can sort of not look at things by focusing on a particular point, say just a point a, a few inches in front of your face. Um, uh, or on a mandala, you can focus on a religious painting or something that's, that can happen too. Uh, that can uh, help avoid distractions of vision. Uh, sitting in an appropriate posture can avoid uh, hence the emphasis on being comfortable. Uh, and uh, you achieve this comfort by doing the, uh, you, you're stiff, you engage in stretching exercises, you're unstable, you engage in stabilization, asanas and so on. That makes it easy for you, comfortable for you to sit in meditative posture. And that uh, prevents uh, kinesthetic bodily uh, body sense uh, experience, you can withdraw from that. But again, what about sound? Uh, sound is a little different. It's a little more difficult. And uh, I, my view is that chanting OM is one of its main functions is simply to allow withdrawal of the senses of sound. As you're uh, chanting that sound, it in effect blocks uh, interference of the uh, of hearing. Uh, and uh, as you can imagine, this is easier to do in a hermitage than it is, say, in a busy uh, city where people would be hailing you and so on. It's easier to do in a, in a hermitage where uh, the whole point of going there is to meditate, and so people aren't going to be disturbing you if you're meditating and so on. And then I have the two references to meditation here. Um, uh, the uh, uh, teacher of all uh, yoga, uh, Ishvara, his speech is Om, uh, and uh, its recitation reveals its power. Uh, those inward, uh, those in, uh, thus, thus inward mindedness is attained and obstacles disappear. So um, I don't think this is principally something mystical. I think it's principally that you can achieve inward focus because OM, chanting OM, uh, limits the obstacles that appear in the form of intrusive experiences of sound. 
Uh, and I, I encourage people to, the M with the dot under it again means you nasalize the preceding vowel. So it isn't om, it's and you can just stretch it out as long as your breath holds. And so I, I encourage you to do that for a second just to get a sense of how it works. Maybe you would want to do the uh, focus uh, a bit before your, uh, like a couple of inches in front of your face with your eyes half closed. I think you can get a sense of how that can contribute to, I, if this were a class, I'd go on for like a minute or so doing it with the class, but I won't do that here. You can take a minute to do it on your own, but it'll give you a sense of how this operates. Okay. Um, after you've withdrawn from the senses, uh, you've gotten into the meditative posture uh, and you're chanting Om, then you can begin the actual meditative practice. And I'm just going to really skim through that very briefly now. I return to it in the next lecture. This has three stages, uh, dharna, concentration, that's where you just look at or think about one single thing. It might be an image. Uh, it might be just a point in space. Uh, uh, as I say, it might be a holy image. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, the point is you're concentrating on it. Uh, and each time your mind drifts away and you notice it, you bring it back to that uh, focal point. Um, Dhyana is uh, a, uh, what's called a st stretching out of dhyana, of uh, dharna. So instead of, well, dharna is very localized, it's very narrow. Dhyana means you continue it. Uh, one way of interpreting this is in a chain of meditation. So thinking about, for example, some aspect of the Vedas, such as the creation hymn where you would concentrate on the flow of ideas of the creation hymn. Uh, another way of thinking about it is you, you get uh, one of those um, uh, uh, religious paintings that uh, uh, in effect embed uh, a sort of spiritual narrative in it and follow the narrative. Um, or a mandala, which you can uh, uh, used to direct your um, thought in a sequence around uh, the, the uh, passing around the mandala uh, or uh, any number of other things. Uh, it's a concentration that has expanded beyond simple disciplining of tying one's mind to a, a point. It's not no longer mechanical it is um, uh, an ex uh, a development of a uh, meditative skill. That's jnana. And by the way, uh, this, is, uh, this is a key aspect of, this refers to, it's usually translated as meditation or often translated as meditation. This is a key aspect uh, that uh, carries over into other religions uh, so that um, uh, the word Zen, for example, in Zen Buddhism actually derives from dhyana or meditation, the Sanskrit. Okay, I don't know why I can never see my cursor. Uh, well, ah, there it is, okay. Dhyana goes through a series of uh, stages where you first are able to maintain it only periodically. You slip in and out of it. You're in, in uh, dharana sometimes. You're sometimes your mind is wandering. Sometimes you make it to dhyana and work through a complex sattvic idea. Um, 
you again it's intermittent at times but again you become what you do the more you succeed in engaging in dhyana or meditation the more that the memory traces of your success uh, have effects on your later practice so just as if you're always going to um, uh, bars and parties and so on that will incline you to go to bars and parties and so on in the future uh, and if you try to sit in meditation it will lead you to think about bars and parties and so on rather than meditation similarly if you sit in meditation and partially succeed in extending in uh, developing dharana and then extending dharana into dhyana you will this this will eventually produce um, little memory traces sanskaras they're called and those sanskaras will help you in the future uh, they will uh, restrain your thought uh, to the practice of dhyana they will help you uh, continue in meditation that you've begun so it's again a form of becoming what you uh, what you do uh, and uh, I'm going to leave till next time how this uh, progresses there are various stages I uh, mostly uh, listed at the end of the Yoga Sutra toward the end of the Yoga Sutra until you get to the stage when you actually realize Purusha and you have basically achieved Samadhi then or self-realization um, but until you die, you haven't fully read, I mean, you obviously haven't reached moksha, you haven't been released because you're still part of the material world or at least connected with the material world. But during that time when you've reached uh, samadhi or reached samadhi to the extent that that is possible while still being part of the material world, you're spoken of as having dharma mega samadhi, uh, which is having the nature, uh, uh, having your nature surrounded by a cloud of samadhi. In other words, you are living in an atmosphere of self-realization within the material world, but you only fully reach the material world at the moment of uh, moksha, and that moment of moksha, of course, comes um, in, uh, in death, uh, which is uh, discussed in those very final uh, passages of the Yoga Sutra, which we may get to next time. But uh, that's what those final, the final passages treat death, not death that leads you back to the sansara, not death that leads you back to the painful cycle of birth, death and rebirth, in other words, it's, it's not a death that's going to lead to another rebirth and another death and suffering and another rebirth and another death and so on. The death that they describe is the death of someone who's already in Dharma Mega Samadhi, who's already living their material life within the cloud, within the sort of protective atmosphere of uh, self-realization, detachment, uh, uh, spiritual uh, liberation, but who has simply not crossed that final threshold to achieve full, uh, full moksha, full realization, full samadhi. And it describes that ending moment when uh, the self-realized person passes over, uh, no longer to be reborn because uh, he or she is no longer attached to the material world, but has recognized uh, his or her true self, uh, the Purusha. So that, again, that's the ending. Okay, well, I've gone uh, 10 minutes over this time, which is uh, not too bad considering what I usually do. Um, so uh, I'll... Uh, to save it for some reason there was a correction on here i don't remember correcting anything anyway um so we're, we'll go through next time we'll go through some i'll go through some passages um to do some detailed textual interpretation uh because as you know that's the sort of thing that's going to be on uh, like the midterm or the well the midterm is what this would be on 
uh, I'll ask you to to take into account the general, our general orientation, our general discussion, but to uh, uh, take that into account in interpreting a particular passage that I'll give you to analyze. So we need to practice some interpretation of particular passages. Okay, so um, until next time. <laughs>